USS Oklahoma, one of the more famous victims of the Pearl Harbor attack, is the topic of today's video. Laid down as the second of the Nevada class, and as such the second of the standard type battleships, Oklahoma was both forward thinking and looking a bit to the past in her design. The improvements of the standard type made it to the use of a very outdated propulsion technology. She would serve a largely uneventful career until that December morning in 1941. There, Oklahoma would become a name well known for all the wrong reasons. Rivaling Arizona in terms of unluckiness in that attack, she would sink so thoroughly that it would take years to raise her, by which point the war had long since passed her by. But then, would Oklahoma have seen much use even if she hadn't been sunk? That question will be answered at the end of this video. As always, the story of Oklahoma begins the same as any other ship. Similar to every American dreadnought before her in being part of a two-ship class with her sister ship, Nevada. These two ships went through a fairly convoluted design process before settling on the final product. This was more of an evolutionary than revolutionary step, to be fair, but it would set the standard for American battleships for the rest of the pre-Washington Treaty designs. First, they swapped to oil-firing boilers. Second, they adopted the all-or-nothing armor scheme. That being, in absolute simplest terms, only armoring the important bits of the hull, and having enough reserve buoyancy in the Citadel that it didn't matter how much of a beating the unarmored ends of the ship took. Grossly oversimplifying, to be sure, but it works. And, thirdly, the ships adopted the triple turret, something the USN would become very fond of. I'll go into more detail on their design process with Nevada herself, so for now I'll move into Oklahoma's construction and service. Fair warning that this will be relatively short on detail by my standards, as the story of Oklahoma is more wrapped up in her salvage than her service, and that's something I'll cover at a later date. Laid down on October 26, 1912, launched on March 23, 1914, and commissioned on May 2, 1916, Oklahoma was a firmly pre-war design that came into service at the height of the Great War. In this, she was like most of the other standards, coming into service as technology was rapidly marching forward. However, in Oklahoma's case, one does have to make note of the fact she was a conservative design, and was, in terms of her propulsion, even more behind than the others. While using oil-fired boilers was ahead of the game in some ways when designed, she retained the old vertical triple expansion engines. In common with the preceding pair of Delaware and North Dakota, the Navy was hedging their bets, as it were. While, as it would turn out, oil-fired boilers made up for how fuel-hungry turbines were, the Navy was still concerned about the long range of Pacific operations. Seeing the older model engines as better for this, Oklahoma was intended to compare with her sister to put that question to bed. And as it would turn out, Nevada demonstrated that turbines were, once and for all, the way of the future, at least for battleships. Or warships in general. Her firepower was in the same situation, really. While her layout of turrets was an improvement, carrying her 10 14-inch guns and 4 super-firing turrets, this with twin turrets over triple turrets, her secondary battery retained the less-than-ideal aspect of casemate-mounted guns, namely that half of them were wet and even a calm sea, and outright uninhabitable in rough weather. And, naturally, she had the questionable torpedo tubes, as most battleships of this vintage did. In any event, and regardless of any actual issues with her design, Oklahoma would have to set out the Great War for the vast majority of it. First, because she was doing peacetime duties, working up and training and the like. The most exciting thing to happen here, being a refit that landed several of her 5-inch guns, and added two 3-inch morale enhancers to her for anti-aircraft defense. And then, even after the United States belatedly joined in at the finish, Oklahoma wasn't sent to reinforce the Grand Fleet at first. Remember, she's an oil-firing battleship, and the British only wanted the old coal burners because they had plenty of coal, but nowhere near enough oil in light of their own needs. This isn't to say Oklahoma wouldn't see any service with the British, though. In August 1918, she would, alongside her sister, be assigned to assist the Grand Fleet. In this they would, alongside Utah, be stationed largely in Ireland for potential use against surface raiders. 
something they would never be called upon to do, with German codes broken and the Grand Fleet doing a fine job of keeping the high seas fleet bottled up. Oklahoma would have a boring time of things, spending the majority of her active service here cooped up in Irish ports. It's telling that the most excitement her crew got up to were sports games and getting into brawls with the Irish ashore. That, and the only losses she suffered, being six from the Spanish flu. Akin to Utah, she would be used to escort President Wilson across the Atlantic a couple times, before returning to the Atlantic fleet proper, and the usual interwar battleship duties. I'll be skimming a lot of this, because she doesn't even have things like Arizona's stowaway to talk about. Most of her service, be it in the Atlantic or Pacific, where she eventually moved, was spent on training and port visits. There was a brief break in the late 20s, where she had a pretty extensive refit done, though. This replaced her lattice mass with far superior tripods, that gave her a distinct silhouette as well, and improved the mountings of her main battery. The elevation in particular was drastically increased, which allowed for much longer range fire. She also had her anti-aircraft battery enhanced with 5-inch guns, with her secondary battery swapped around again, moved a deck higher for better habitability. Torpedo bulges were added, which decreased her speed a bit, and her own torpedoes were removed. This was a pretty extensive refit, though not by any means a rebuild akin to what her sister would receive after Pearl Harbor. It also, very notably, did not replace her power plant. She retained the triple expansion engines, which limited her ability to steam for long and high speed, well, as high speed as a standard can ever get, and made her crew miserable when she tried from vibration. The 1930s were largely boring and uneventful, save for a brief stint rescuing American civilians from the outbreak of the Spanish Civil War. She would do that, have some periods in dock for routine maintenance, and participate in the fleet problems. It wouldn't be until the dawn of the 1940s that Oklahoma's career picked up again. And that was because she was assigned, as with the rest of the Pacific Fleet, to Pearl Harbor. It was here she would remain for the rest of her active service, barring a couple trips to the mainland for repair and refit, including contriving to break a propeller shaft, forcing repairs in San Francisco. As if that wasn't enough, she also managed to collide with Arizona during training in October 1941, which is an odd omen of things to come if there ever was one. It had to be those two ships, didn't it? At any rate, while she was doing those duties, Oklahoma would be scheduled to retire in May of 1942. Newer ships were coming into service, and her outdated propulsion made even operating with the other standards something of a chore. Oklahoma was always the least efficient and effective of the type, and there was little enough reason, it must have seemed, to keep her hanging around by that point, with the North Carolinas, South Dakotas, Iowas, and even the Montanas potentially coming around. As it would turn out, she would be taken out of service. Not in the way the Navy would have probably preferred, though. Anchored in Pearl Harbor on December 7th, Oklahoma would prove to be a particular focus of the Japanese attack. Sending alongside the USS Maryland, Oklahoma would end up being hit by up to nine torpedoes. This, to be clear, would have caused critical damage to any ship. Caught completely unprepared by the attack, Oklahoma's guns were not even able to be fired as her magazines were locked up and no ready ammunition was easily available. She was not quite as unfortunate as, say, California, in having all her watertight doors open and her hatches and portholes open for inspection, but Oklahoma simply took so many hits that even a more modern battleship would have had great difficulty faring better. The first two torpedoes blew away much of her torpedo blister, but they didn't really do critical damage. The third one did pierce her hull, having hit in more or less the same location as the previous two. This began to cause Oklahoma to list a port, which when two more torpedoes hit above the torpedo protection as a result, pretty much doomed her. The final torpedoes that hit her as she progressively rolled over were, simply put, overkill at that point. They blasted massive holes into her side, the diagram on screen shows this, but they weren't necessary to sink her. Rolling over in less than 30 minutes, Oklahoma's crew would move to Maryland, or desperately find shelter elsewhere, as the Japanese strafe the water around the ship and strafe those clinging to her hull. Some brave souls would attempt to cut out their comrades trapped below decks, something that would continue after the attack until it became apparent there was no one left to save. 
429 of her crew would be dead or missing by the end of the attack. The story of her salvage, after the attack was over, is a long and convoluted one, though. To give a brief summary here, occupying a valuable birthing space, there's a reason Battleship Row was used as it was, Oklahoma's hulk had to be either moved or scrapped in place. When it became apparent that it was possible to salvage her, if ruinously expensive and time-consuming to do so, this was done. The Herculean efforts involved many steps. Entering the sunken hull to patch her enough to pump air in to force water out. Riding her capsized hulk with winches ashore. Patching the damage once she was righted enough to move her to dry dock. And once in dry dock, removing whatever bodies hadn't already been removed, along with all her guns and ammunition and other assorted stores. Oklahoma's repairs wouldn't be completed until 1944, though even before then the Navy had already decided she was too old and heavily damaged, both from actual damage and her time capsized, to be worth returning to service. As a result, Oklahoma would be decommissioned in 1944, and sold for scrap in 1946. She would never be scrapped. In a storm on May 17, 1947, Oklahoma would sink under tow some 500 miles from Hawaii. Whatever repairs had been made were undone by nature that day, and the ship's final resting place remained something of a mystery. A shame, as a delegation of Oklahomans had been waiting to pay their respects to their ship. Now, to rope back around to the start of the video. Would the Navy have kept Oklahoma in service, even absent the attack? Probably not, though it's not impossible. As mentioned, she was already scheduled for decommissioning, and I struggle to see that changing even if she had escaped completely undamaged. She was old, and unlike Nevada, not really worth modernizing to the same extent. The only other triple expansion battleships left in service were the New York's, which were reduced to shore bombardment and the odd convoy escort. At absolute best, I can see Oklahoma doing the same things. Refitting her with turbines would have been prohibitively expensive, especially with all the other rebuilds going on. And if she took damage in the attack, even if it were something more akin to California, most likely she would have just been decommissioned in the same way she was historically, for pretty much the same reasons old and not worth the effort to repair compared to her sister. Oklahoma was probably doomed to not see out World War II in active service, no matter what happened. She might have had a second chance in shore bombardment, but even then the Navy might not have done that. A shame, perhaps, but then we all know what happened to her in our history. Thank you for watching, I hope you enjoyed the video, remember to like, comment, and subscribe if you do, and I'll see you in the next one.